Every time I see a self-driving car, I can't help but wonder what kind of inner mechanisms are at work. There are many automotive companies today that are pursuing self-driving. A few big names probably come to mind. In this relatively new space, there are lots of challenges coming up each day. Training ML models with appropriate data sets is one of those big challenges. So to dig deeper into this, I have the pleasure of speaking with Harrison, who is at Helm AI and is helping companies scale their capabilities with ML models that teach themselves. Harrison, thanks so much for being here. Could you please tell us a little bit about yourself and about Helm AI? Yeah, thanks for having me here today, Debbie. Uh, so my name is Harrison. I'm the tech lead of the platform team at Helm AI. Uh, so the platform team is uh, focused on building internal infrastructure for other engineers at Helm. So Helm AI, uh, we're a company, we're a startup that's focused on building uh, vision-based perception uh, for autonomous vehicles. Notably, we're actually not building our own car. Uh, we just license software to OEMs and other tier one manufacturers for vehicles. And then the thing that kind of sets Helm apart is that we have this approach called deep teaching, uh, which is a variation of unsupervised learning. It enables us to train models at much greater scale and lower cost too. That's super interesting that Helm AI is kind of thinking about this approach a little differently, and it's building the software versus the actual car. I want to know a little bit more about this deep teaching on supervised learning that you mentioned. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so there's basically two main approaches. One is supervised and the other is unsupervised learning. So with supervised learning, you need to uh, get a bunch of data. So in the case of like self-driving vehicles, we're working with camera uh, data. So we we need a bunch of frames and we need to like label things in those frames. So we might need to like say, you know, this is a bounding box and this inside of this bounding box is a car. Or, you know, we draw like a line and say, you know, this is like a lane marker or something. But to train a model using supervised learning, we basically have to do this for, you know, millions and millions of frames and then uh, have the neural net learn based on what the human annotations are. With unsupervised learning, the idea is that the model should be able to train itself for the most part. And then we only need like a few labels to basically guide that learning. Um, so we still need labels, obviously, but at a much smaller, smaller scale. And then the thing is, getting labels is actually not cheap, right? Because, you know, how can you label something? Um, well, you need like a model that already can identify it. Well, we don't have that. So we need to rely on like humans, right? So uh, getting people to annotate uh, video frames accurately uh, and at scale is very hard. Uh, it takes a lot of time and money to do that. You know, you can imagine we could go with the supervised learning approach um, and train, you know, models that are effective in driving cars. But I think then the question is like, at what cost? You know, you might end up spending a lot of money just to uh, solve new edge cases. So that makes a lot of sense. So you're saving time and money by taking the unsupervised learning approach because you don't have to label everything. Is there like a real world example that you would say uh, to explain this? Yeah, so to kind of get the intuition for this, uh, you can kind of think about, you know, when you're a young child, you don't know a lot about the world, right? But you're exposed to like a whole bunch of different like examples of things, right? So you might see like a whole bunch of trees, but not realize that they actually are trees or that they're called trees, right? And you don't need someone to come and tell you, hey, this oak tree is a tree. This pine tree is also a tree. You know, you can kind of see the patterns and similarities, right? You learn to recognize, oh, there's a trunk and there's some leaves. All it takes is for someone to come to you one day and say like, hey, this is a tree. And then you realize, you know, all these other things that you saw in the past, even though you didn't know what they were called at the time, now you know that they're trees. That's so awesome. It's basically like natural learning. So in addition to maybe knowing what a tree is, what other use cases uh, could this be used in? So you can take this same kind of intuition and apply it to autonomous vehicles. So you can't uh, predict everything that's going to happen on the road, um, but you need to account for a lot of these edge cases. Usually training for uh, and solving edge cases is actually the hardest part. And basically what we want is like to train models on a whole bunch of examples, but only need to label a small number of those edge cases. That's super interesting how the software learns from just one label to labeling many things that it's seen before. The software that you're, that Helm AI uses and has built, is this limited to cars or can it be used on other things as well? Yeah, that's a great question. So right now, Helm is focused on uh, autonomous vehicles. 
So everything from L2 plus and up, uh, we're kind of uh, targeting. Vision is not something that's limited to self-driving, right? We can apply the same same principles to robotics. Uh, so anything that requires like identifying objects um, via like cameras and vision, like I think that's totally within the domain of like Helm's expertise. So we actually took a model that we trained off of a camera on a car and put it onto a drone and saw that it was able to identify, you know, the same things, roads and vehicles, uh, even though it had never seen any drone footage before. Wow, that is mind blowing to think about. That's so interesting. So now that I understand a little bit like how the software works, let's talk about kind of what's under the hood. What is the architecture, the cloud infrastructure that's going on behind the scenes? So there are a whole bunch of like things that the research engineers need to do before it even comes time to train a model. You know, one of those things is like converting all of the uh, sensor data from cars into a common format, you know, getting that all that data labeled. Once it's labeled, then we finally can, you know, train a model based on that data. And then afterwards, we also have to validate the results and, you know, make sure the model's like actually performing well in all sorts of scenarios. And so everything I kind of described just now is actually, you can think of it as like a data transformation, right? You take sensor data, convert it into labeled data, you know, that sort of stuff. Or you take labeled data and you convert it into a model that can, you know, recognize those, those objects. So what we did at Helm was we built out uh, some like generic infrastructure uh, using uh, Google Kubernetes engine. So we have a cluster that we can use uh, for just running anything on the cloud. Uh, obviously, the reason we you know need it on the cloud is because we're we're working with a lot of data, so it's not feasible for us to have all the compute and memory you know resources uh, locally or like in the office, right? We built out a super simple like uh, solution to the problem at hand, which was we just want to be able to run arbitrary code on the cluster. So the first thing we did was. We said, OK, so research engineers are going to write the actual code that has the logic. Uh, and these are called like jobs or tasks. And then the research engineers can take these jobs and send them to uh, a scheduler. These schedulers put the jobs into like a database uh, so that we can keep track of everything. And then on our GKE cluster, we have uh, like job workers that will go and pull jobs and just do them. So these workers are also preemptible. So like if one of the workers dies, another one will take its place and just uh, finish the job for it. Yeah. And so there's also a whole bunch of other things that we need to build uh, to kind of support this sort of operation. So one of the things is like uh, an auto scaler that will you know scale up the, the different nodes. So after the worker uh, takes the job and uh, kind of does whatever needs to be done, uh, the outputs can be stored in like Google Cloud Storage or even Cloud SQL, kind of depending on the needs. So it's like a very generic infrastructure to just run arbitrary code on the cluster, you know, read data also from the cloud and output data uh, into the cloud. That makes sense. Can you go into how you landed on this particular design? So when we kind of originally built this out, you know, Helm was a very uh, early stage startup. And we were really just focused on building out the bare minimum to get things done, right? You know, we didn't try to do anything extremely sophisticated. Like when the research engineers write their code, you know, we just take the whole thing, the whole, uh, their whole workspace, like repository, we just archive it and just uh, upload it to the cloud. Like we didn't try to do anything fancy uh, there. And then another big thing for us was like, we really needed to process a lot of data and keep the cost low, right? So as a startup, you know, we don't have a lot of cash. So we have to make sure that, you know, every penny counts. Um, so that's why we're using preemptible instances. Uh, it helps us a lot with cost. And we actually have uh, we actually have multiple clusters. So we basically just took the same uh, design and we deployed it multiple times into different regions. Uh, obviously, like if we were to go back and redo it, like it would be great if we just had a single scheduler and then like the work could be done in any cluster. Um, but the simplest thing to do at the time was, you know, just take the thing that we built and was working and just scale it up by duplicating it. Uh, and that's kind of how we just like uh, tackled the quickly growing like uh, needs of the company. That makes sense. Based on your business needs, you make the decisions you need to for the architecture. So I see you're also using some other Google Cloud products. Can you tell us a little bit about those? So to kind of give an example, uh, our customers are often curious like how our nets are performing in various different uh, conditions. So like they often want to know you know, how's it doing in day, daytime versus nighttime or, you know, different weather conditions like sun versus rain. 
And they're also often curious about like how we're performing on very specific cases. So like, how are we doing for, you know, trucks or versus sedans or bicycles and motorcycles? And so being able to use BigQuery uh, is really great for this, where we can just kind of slice and dice by any sort of like dimension that we care about. And then the other thing is Data Studio, which integrates really well with this is like, we can build uh, dashboards with like graphs and charts with all of this information and just very easily be able to like glance at it after training and say, you know, these are all the things we care about and they, you know, they still look good for, for the model. That's really interesting to hear how you're using BigQuery and Data Studio along with some other Google Cloud services. So I'm curious to know if you ran into any challenges while you were implementing these services and how you dealt with them. Yeah, I think definitely the two biggest challenges were like uh, working with a lot of data and keeping costs low because these things often don't go hand in hand. How much data would you say you were working with and how did you manage that? Yeah, so we're working on uh, the order of like petabytes of data. And obviously, as Helm grows and matures as a company, we're only going to be working with more and more. Uh, so one of the things that we did was we built our data lake using Google Cloud Storage. Um, so basically, all of our data is in here. And it just makes it a lot easier uh, when everything is like stored on the same uh, in, the, in the same place. To kind of like find data more easily, we built like a whole bunch of like queryable indexes in Google Cloud SQL. So you know, oftentimes we want to be able to find very specific videos or models or data. So we built a whole bunch of databases to kind of like organize ourselves, to organize all the data that we do store in the cloud. And of course, we, you know, we have other UI tools that we built in-house to like uh, view and modify data. So one of them is just like a video server where you can um, play back videos that you generated. Or like another one is to be able to view uh, labeled data and uh, modify and tweak it. And then a another big thing is we have an archive daemon that just runs periodically and takes any uh, any data that's like older than a, a few months and we just like put it into archive storage to save on cost. Wow. Okay. So that's a lot of stuff being managed. You mentioned that you know as you continue to grow, you'll probably have more data. So your architecture might change a little. Are there any other future technical enhancements to your architecture that might come up? There's definitely many things that we want to get done as a company, um, and all of it is going to be a trade-off, you know, between short and long-term commitments. Um, I think one of the things that we're kind of eager to do eventually is like to take advantage of the multi-region capabilities of Google Cloud. So one of the things I mentioned before was like we basically took our design and to scale it up, we just basically duplicated it in different regions. The researchers have to submit their jobs to very specific places. Like they need to know, you know how much work is being done on a particular cluster, allocate their, their jobs accordingly, right? They have to like coordinate between each other to uh, figure out where they should submit their jobs. Obviously this is an ideal, like I, I think it would be much better, you know, if everyone could just submit their jobs to the same place and then the infrastructure and the system can take care of, you know, load balancing uh, and scale in that sense. Uh, one of the other things that we definitely want to do better at is like our data lake organization. Um, so I think right now we're doing okay, but one of the things that's kind of unique about our space is that there's like a lot of different versions of data. So uh, for example, like once we bring in customer data, it's actually, we can't just like train a model directly on that. Oftentimes we have to convert, convert the data into a common format. So one of the things is like rectification. And so this is highly dependent on, you know, camera parameters that we get from the customer. And a lot of times there's just things like lost in translation where it's like, oh yeah, sorry, we actually sent you the wrong camera parameters. So uh, can you just like redo everything using the new ones, right? And so you might have to like retrain your model, relabel the data, uh, you know, these sorts of things where it just like generates a new version of the same stuff. Uh, so ideally we, you know, want to have a better solution around how we're managing all these different versions of the data, as well as just the sheer scale of the data. That makes a lot of sense. When you're dealing with a lot of data, organization is key. Harrison, thank you so much for being here today and for talking to us about Helm AI and the magic that goes on. Uh, where can people go to learn more? Yeah, thanks so much for having me here today, Debbie. Uh, so we have a website with a jobs page if you're interested in Helm. Uh, also, there's a LinkedIn and blog there as well. Well, now next time I see a self-driving car, I know some of the magic, more AI and machine learning that's happening under the hood. As always, if you're interested in learning more, check out the links in the description that Harrison mentioned and subscribe for more great customer stories. Thanks for watching.